so good to have this band. Isn't this band amazing? Yeah. I mean, honestly, it, you know, I tell people here, I, some, somebody was visiting a while back from another church, and they asked me, they said, so what are y'all that's doing that you do that's different here? And then I thought, well, now that we've been doing everything so different here for so long, I don't know. <laughs> and this band is so amazing, it's hard to tell people just how what an incredible cover band this group is. I mean, the kind of breadth of music that they can cover and do and the talent of the musicians themselves. So um, I thought about... So nobody noticed it was out of tune during that whole song, right? Good thing was I only had to play one string. <laughs> so, um, so I've told this. I'm going to tell it really quickly. I think it applies to this. Uh, my uncle told me this story years ago. This guy in the Middle East who wanted to learn how to play. He, my uncle told me it was a, it was originally like a, 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 a balilaka, but um, we're going to say it was a ukulele. So my uncle says that this fellow wants to learn how to play a ukulele, and so he wants to be a master. He's pretty much mastered theology, philosophy, pol political science, and he wants to master an instrument. Goes to an instructor of the ukulele and says, I want to learn how to play this and be just as uh, magnificent. So what do I need to do? How do I approach it? The guy says, it's simple. I'll charge you 30 denarii for the first lesson, 20 for the second lesson. And so the guy says, fine, I'll start with the second lesson. <laughs> After only one lesson, he feels like he's a master at the instrument, takes his new little ukulele, goes to the middle of the little village square, sits down, and starts to play a note. Every now and then, he softens the note and then strikes more diligently. If he ever hits another string, he looks up and apologizes for the moment and then comes back to it. After a while, people ran up to him because after about two hours of this, it became a little bit annoying. And someone finally grabbed the instrument, nuzzled, uh, muffled the thing, says, what do you think you're doing? He says, I'm playing the ukulele. I'm a master. They say, you're not a master. You're a buffoon. You're an idiot. You can't play that thing at all. You're destroying the instrument. He said, no, 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 no. I am a master. They said, we've heard masters. Masters play up and down the neck. They play these beautiful melodies, these wonderful tunes. You're playing the same note over and over. How do you explain that? And he says, simple. They're all looking for this one note. <laughs> so I told that story. I told that story, and I started off then. I followed off with this wonderful Latin piece that some of the band members know, the uh, one-note samba. So you hear that one note, right? That's what I expected from this crowd when I was playing in Edinburgh at the International Fringe Festival, at their ukulele vaudeville. The place was packed. I told the story. There was a chuckle. I thought, OK, they'll get this because it's a ukulele vaudeville. And I played the instrument, and there was a smattering of applause. It was a competition. It, the whole thing went for a week and a half, two weeks throughout the whole International uh, Fringe Festival. But this thing went on every night. So that night, I was one of the folks playing up there, about five or six people. I came in tied for third place, <laughs> beaten by a guy who sang, tiptoe through the tulip, da -da -da -da. But he was on stilts as he played it. <laughs> Second place went to a guy who was cross-dressed and sang not another, and I won't say the word, but another freaking song about ukuleles. And he won second place, and they gave me third place because the guy came up afterwards and said, well, actually, he can play the instrument. <laughs> so we ought to give him third place. But afterwards, I thought, you know, I, I, I thought, well, there'd be all this great attention, and these folks would love it. They'd come up and talk to me. They'd think how wonderful this instrument was and how wonderful I can play the instrument. And I realized I'd missed the whole point of what this event was about and why they even call it Fringe Festival to begin with, because everything is about being completely open and on the edge. Every experience, every, mo every event, whether it's the most amazing, talented, practiced, disciplined event of acrobatics, or if it's the woman who's practiced all of her life and is able to nail a nail into her nostril <laughs> without breaking blood or sweat, it's impressive. <laughs> 
It didn't matter. The whole festival, which goes on for several weeks and gathers thousands and thousands and thousands of people from all over the world, the whole point is that its experience is to be on the edge. And I was right in the middle. I mean, I was good, but I was just right in the middle. They had to give me something out of sympathy, but I'd missed the point. I think sometimes we miss the point with this story. I think sometimes we see this story and we talk about it's the candle of joy and it's the week of joy, the second week is the week we remember to be joyful. And we think about Mary's announcement of rejoice and, and she says, behold, I'm the handmaiden of God and now there's joy to be introduced into the world because of this. I think we miss the point with this story. It's easy to miss it when we forget to think about what it means personally. And I'll get into that for just a second, but I, what I want you to think about is where you find joy. Where you find joy in your life, and where does it seek to be born in you? Because I think they're two different things. Anna Popova, and I'm going to hopefully I pronounce her name right. Some of you, some of you uh, may be familiar with Brain Pickings, this wonderful uh, online blog site that just has. Uh, the, if you have, does anybody in here read? I know that Sharm does. I know Lynn does, and some others do fascinating, amazing blog. You should check it out. It's called Brain Pickings. And it's just a smattering and sampling of some of the richest literary literature over the centuries, as well as current, as well as inspirational stuff, poetry, just an amazing, amazing site. And one of the things that she said here not too long ago was, and I thought this was interesting, because this is the season of waiting, Advent. This is the season of expectancy, we say. And of course, today, the announcement of expectancy. So this is what I found interesting that Anna Popova said. The greatest obstacle to deep living is expectancy, which hangs upon tomorrow and loses today. The whole future lies in uncertainty, so live immediately. Stay with this just a minute because this is a bit contrary to what a lot of folks are going to be preaching today. Our season is all about waiting and expectancy. And yet, what Anna says, and I think it's worth pondering, is that the greatest obstacle to deep living is this idea of expectancy, which hangs upon tomorrow and loses today. Annie Dillard said that how we spend our days is, of course, how we spend our lives. And as I started looking through things, I, I came across one of my favorite readers that some of you know, Bill Longsworth here, who was a professor at Bright Divinity School for years before he was on staff here for years and is now towards a full retirement now as, as one of our pastors here. Some of you may have had the benefit to hear him speak or to, to be in his teaching. He taught Kierkegaard, Soren Kierkegaard, who was a, a, um, a Dutch philosopher and ethicist from the, I think it's 18th century. Now I'm going to forget, but I believe it's late 18th century. And, and we, we took a couple of classes, Linda and I both did, and one of the things that I loved about Kierkegaard was his book he had was called Purity of Heart, because his phrase was, purity of heart is to will one thing. And he writes that, he writes that um, our greatest source of unhappiness is to recognize that busyness is a decision and that presence is infinitely more rewarding than productivity. Again, somewhat contrary to the culture we live in. So I'll read it again. Our greatest source of unhappiness, he says, is our refusal to recognize that busyness is a decision and that presence is infinitely more rewarding than productivity. What is it that drives our lives? What is it that motivates our living? I was visiting with a friend recently at a cafe, and it's this wonderful restaurant over on, beside 7-Eleven on Camp Bowie. It's a it's an uh, Ethiopian restaurant. Don't know if you guys have eaten there yet, but he's an amazing, and I can't even remember the guy's name. Does somebody remember his name that owns the, he, Samson, thank you very much. Yeah, amazing guy. Samson actually was very helpful in my own younger son's growing up because he would go over there on his own to pick up sodas and whatever, and Samson and he would get into deep discussion. Samson's from uh, the Middle East, but, but uh, or from actually from Northern Africa, I guess, from, from the Ethiopian region. And, and he started this restaurant kind of on a leap of faith, and so a lot of the neighbors have continued to kind of attend it and participate and, and eat the Ethiopian, which is an interesting experience if you've never eaten Ethiopian food, but it's delicious. 
But we ate over there. A friend of mine and I ate there, and uh, he was a ret- he's a retired minister. And we were talking. He's from Tennessee, and we were talking about all of the stuff going on again right now. And it was interesting because he, as a minister, like all of us as ministers, or in, in speaking in these kind of contexts, we realize we are in the midst of fear. We realize we're in the midst of conflict in our culture right now. We need to address these kinds of things. And he was talking about how complicated that gets politically, for one thing, and how complicated it can get religiously for another thing. And he's now retired, and he says, you know what? I'm just enjoying retirement. I'm just going to go enjoy myself and spend out my days doing some fun stuff. And I looked at him, and I said, do you still worry? And he said, I try not to. I thought that was interesting. This idea that sometimes we busy ourselves as a way of dealing not just with what we think we should be doing, but sometimes to deal with what we're afraid of dealing with. We busy ourselves. Some of the most great, some of the most uh, keen motivations in our culture, we've talked about many times, fear. We see politicians now running for office, thriving on fear. Fear is a great motivator, especially if we can pick on something and then make you really afraid, then we can tell you we got the answer. It's just what advertisers have been doing for, for, for decades, right? I never forget when mouthwash came out. When's the first time we learned that we had bad breath? <laughs> you know, and mouthwash comes out, and you're going like, oh, my gosh, I've got to get it, or people are going to ignore me or turn from me or shun me or leave elevators when I step inside. The reality is advertising is designed to make you think you need something, and that's how we can sell the product. Most of life is centered around these ideas of incompleteness, these ideas of fear, these ideas of I never met up to expectations. And as uh, Seneca, who was the first century philosopher, he wrote, I like his phrase, he says, what we end up becoming is because we never truly know who we are, because we live by fear or we live by shame, and so we never truly know who we really are, we become accomplished fugitives from ourselves. Isn't that interesting? My friend, the retired minister, in many ways, he at that point had finally become kind of an accomplished fugitive of his own life. The very essence of the gospel message is not about running. It's about diving in. It's about opening up. It's about vulnerability. It's about unknown. It's not about waiting for something to happen. It's about suddenly realizing something is happening. Oh, my gosh, i got to do something and jumping in. But we spend most of our time, I think, trying to line ourselves up and protect ourselves. And in a lot of ways, we miss the real possibility of joy. A friend of mine once said this. He said, we spend a lot of time loving stuff, loving life, but we forget to show real interest. Do you know what that means? We love stuff but we forget to show real interest. I said this once before in here, and actually several times, that word interest, if you go look it up and you look at its root meaning, you remember what it, what it is? The word interest means to connect and give life. It's to connect to life. Essay, Latin for love, living life, enter, to connect between. What would it mean if real joy was to be found in making one another's lives interesting, for example? What would it mean if we pursued things not in terms of beliefs that protect us or in terms of creeds that hold us in and put walls around us so that at least we don't think we have to be afraid? What would it mean instead if we dove in, if we said yes, when Mary's told, you're pregnant, guess what? Our whole life's going to be turned upside down. And she's like, right on, watch this. Because that word behold doesn't mean like, Behold, I am the handmaiden of the Lord. That word literally means, look at this, check this out, watch what's going to happen. And why would someone like Mary feel that? We've, we have attributed to Mary over the centuries this demure, almost demeaning kind of personality, when in reality, Mary was quite assertive, quite engaged with the reality around her, recognizing the oppression of her own people recognizing the inequality and the oppressiveness of reality she lived in. And here was this promise for something, this promise for hope. Here was simply this suggestion that says, you're going to be a part of the change. She'd been, she'd not, she'd not just been waiting for it. She'd been digging for it. 
Now, whether or not you want to play around with this story as a historical occurrence doesn't matter so much to me because it's not about the miracle of a, pra- of a, of a virgin birth or, an immac- or immaculate conception. It's not about that. This story, like the previous one that we talked about last week, this story is an opportunity to look. It's an opportunity to see nativity, to reflect on our own. You know the word nativity means birth, right? It's nowhere else mentioned. We speak of nativity of, of, a, of a martyr. We speak of a nativity of Christ. We speak of others worshiping at the nativity of Christ. It's nowhere else mentioned. It's not a sacred word. You and I have nativity. You and I have scenes around which people gathered, around which hope was gathered, around which excitement was gathered, and we were born into this world. Every one of us has nativity. Even in the mystery, if we, were, if we were adopted or if we don't know our parents, even in that mystery, we were born in the context of a narrative that says something possible is going to happen. Mary said yes to that. Mary said, watch what's going to happen. So here's what I think, and I'm just going to say this quickly as we get to the end. Something for you to think about. The good news, the good news is not, well, maybe it is, I won't go so far as to say it won't, but in my mind, what's not important about this story is the good news that Jesus came so that we can all go to heaven, but not all of us, you or me and maybe somebody else who gets lucky and they join in with us, (laughs) because you see, it's pretty much a club, right? That thinking. Jesus, the the Son of God, wasn't born into the world so that you or I could have a better life. It just ain't that way. It's not what it's about. Jesus wasn't born into the world so that you and I would adopt certain beliefs so that we could align with certain clubs or certain thinking or certain mentality and build a certain walls so that we'd be guaranteed a certain sense of protection and future eternity. I have no idea what happens after we die. And I don't think that's what this is about. I think this good news is stop waiting and start acting. The way in which Albert Camus said it, who was one of my favorite philosophers to study in in college, one of the most pessimistic persons I thought I'd ever read, just really existential and dark at times. And then I came to read him a couple of years ago and find out he has this really bright side to him. He's got this fun side to him that I never knew existed. And one of the things he said is that if you are overwhelmed with darkness and you can't find your way to that place of joy, but you want to think it's there, you want to hope it's there, you want to believe it might be there, he says, then act as if. He just says, act as if. Time's running out. Just act as if. I think that's what we're invited to do. I think that's what this story is about doing. This story is about telling us that if we act as if we are participating in something that's going to change, as if we are loved, as if we have hope, as if we know peace. What was it Mary Oliver said? You don't have to be good. You don't have to walk on your knees for 100 miles through the desert repenting. You only have to let the soft animal of your body love what it loves. There is this sense of openness and vulnerability that says yes in spite of a world of hate in spite of a a political uh, platform of hate and fear, in spite of advertising that reminds us we don't have enough yet, in spite of the world around us that says we need more, in spite of all of that, there is an as if that says, see what happens when you say yes to what you don't know yet, but you start living as if. That's where I think we become a nativity that is seen.